Thank you, and thank you for welcoming us to this beautiful venue in this beautiful city, and thank you for sharing your weekend with us. I am delighted to be in conversation with Arundhati Subramaniam, no relation, as you just discovered, uh, about her book, Women Who Wear Only Themselves. Arundhati, let's start with that title. What does that mean, Women Who Wear Only Themselves? The title for me actually um, was a phrase that surfaced while I was writing the introduction to this book. And as I wrote that uh, phrase, it struck me that this could possibly be a title. It was a provisional title at the time. And later I thought about it, and it feels to me, Mansi, and maybe you can tell me whether I'm right on this or not, but it feels to me that the title works actually literally on the one hand, because these are four utterly diverse, very idiosyncratic spiritual travelers, little known in India. And each one of them actually speaks of clothing at some point or the other in the course of the conversation I had with them. So the sartorial metaphor, as a poet, I'm often looking for the image that recurs. This was the image that recurred. There's one who chooses to wear a monk's robes. She chooses to move from lay clothing, in a sense, to ochre, which is the color of renunciation. There is another who gives up ochre and chooses to wear blue jeans and decides that's as much a color of renunciation for her, or a color, let's say, of spiritual engagement for her. There's a third who lived in her mind much of the time and suddenly found herself plummeting into the body. And she realizes that the body is a new kind of garment that she had never quite acknowledged, never quite made her peace with. That's another kind of metaphor for clothing. And then there's the fourth woman who chooses to wear no clothes at all. She's a naked woman mystic. So it struck me that it worked perfectly on the level of just a very literal image, but uh, it also, for me, was a book about women who carve their own journeys, their own life journeys, unapologetically, without looking for validation outside of them. These are hugely independent journeys to be undertaking, without any spiritual ecosystem, really, to support them. One of them, of course, is part of an organization, but uh, it was still a leap into the unknown, the step that she took. So the fact that these are women who lead these extraordinary lives in the middle of the very crazy modern workaday world that we all inhabit, but they lead it with this kind of ferocious, single-minded determination, and... Um, they also choose not to be very well known. And I think this fed into something that for me has been a long-standing preoccupation, Mansi, which is the fact that really we don't hear women's narratives enough. Mm -hmm. So I happen to have written a book, as was mentioned, I happen to have written a book on the Buddha. Yeah. And I happen to have written a book on a contemporary mystic and guru, Sadhguru. And I'm delighted to have done those. But I really felt that the voices of women was something I was thirsting for. So um, when these four interviews coalesced and um, suggested themselves into a manuscript, it felt like this title would actually work. Because these are journeys of self-reclamation, really. I would be utterly remiss, of course, if I did not mention what a beautiful sari you are wearing. Oh. <laughs> well... <laughs> On occasion, I, and, I wear the right thing. And wearing it beautifully as well. Um, but let's talk about these four women. Can you give us a little snapshot of the four women that you have chosen to travel with? Um, well, let me say this. I was actually working on an anthology of women mystics down history in India. And then it struck me that I actually had interviews with four living women and I wasn't giving it the kind of importance that I believed they deserved. So I started looking at those transcripts again. And that's how these four women come 
you know, emerged on the page. They're women I happen to have met accidentally in the course of this past decade. And uh, the first is a woman called Annapurni Amma, who wears her body like a lion. That's how I describe her in the book. She sits there resplendent in her nakedness, choosing to live that way. As in fact, there have been, I mean, there have been mendicants down the ages in a tradition of what we call the avadhutas of this subcontinent who actually did walk the world without clothing, proudly, fearlessly. And as I've talked to her, and she was a fascinating character, I think what for me emerged was the fact that this was a woman with nothing to protect and nothing to prove. And that allowed her to wear herself and wear her body like almost like an afterthought. There was a fearlessness about her presence. So that's the first woman in the book. The second is a, and she's in the ecstatic mystical tradition. The second is a woman on the path of Nada Yoga. That is a woman who is guided on the path of primal sound. Mantras pour out of her, and she uses those mantras to guide others on their spiritual journeys. Her name is, she's called Bala Rishi. And for me, she was fascinating because she's not a seeker who then turned into this self-realized figure and then became a guru. She actually starts out as a guru because of her parents who put this undue pressure on her, recognizing that she has these spiritual attainments. And her journey is actually one of discarding that identity of guru and turning into a seeker. And then discovering that she does indeed have a calling as a teacher. And so she retrieves that role, but now on her own terms. So a very different story. The third is a woman who is a scholar, a Marxist, a feminist a scholar who's done some groundbreaking work on sati. And she happened to be on a journey to her place of work one morning in California, riding along a freeway, and she collided with a Pepsi truck. And her life turned turtle, and she was plunged, as I said earlier, from mind into body. So the path of Tantra, which is the path that acknowledges the sacredness of embodiment, that becomes her journey, a very different journey. And the fourth and the last is the most intimate portrait, perhaps, in the book. And I wanted to conclude with that because uh, William Dalrymple, who was here a little while ago on this very chair, has a wonderful book called Nine Lives that some of you may have read. And one of the, the essays in that book is, um, is about a Jain nun. And there is a description of a friendship between that Jain nun and another woman in her order. And I want, that description was so heartwarming that I wanted that warmth to be part of the book. This particular monk in my book happens to be a friend of mine. And it becomes therefore a much more intimate portrait. I was just interested in her because what kind of woman today in the modern world, and she is this very talkative, energetic, opinionated woman who one day decides to join the monkhood. And she is, for me, a reminder that the spiritual journey, and when we speak of devotion in particular, she is, for me, a reminder that there is nothing submissive, docile, meek um, about the idea of bhakti or devotion. She reminds me that it is a spirited relationship. And that for me is really what bhakti is about. And it's at the heart of a book that I edited called Eating God, which I mention here because I suddenly discovered minutes ago that one of the translators who contributed to that book, Meena Desai, is right here. I'm just delighted. And we are meeting for the first time. And we'd really met a minute ago. But eating God for me was that reminder, a reminder that bhakti or devotion is not submission. And I think we need to say this again and again, uh, Mansi, because particularly now in India, the word has been used, mangled in so many ways, often used to suggest an uncritical adherence to right-wing politics. Yeah. 
when in fact bhakti is a very spirited, argumentative, sometimes tempestuous, sometimes passionate, sometimes erotic relationship with the sacred. Yeah. So for me, Ma Karpuri, the last character, is a reminder of that. You told us about the four women, but are there women you could have included in the book that you wanted to, because you can't obviously make space for everyone, but there are so many travelers that you must have met along the way. Is there a sample set that you can share with us? There must be innumerable women, Mansi. I, this was just uh, a sliver, really. Mm. But these happen to be particularly meaningful conversations for me. And it was in the great hush of the pandemic when I found myself at home looking at the transcripts of those interviews that I felt... I was just amazed at the richness of the material. And I just felt, if I am enriched by this, there must be someone out there who's as crazy as I am, you know, who will appreciate these oddball journeys. But are there other women? Of course. And there have been so many down the ages. Uh, many of them, we, there are several names we know in terms of the Indian spiritual culture. But how many remain undocumented? Yeah, because I also, when I was reading your book, I was also thinking... We know so little about women mystics. We know so much about the men. Yes. So was that part of it for you? It was. And in fact, the book that I was at work on, which was then interrupted by this one, was about women mystics in the subcontinent, particularly the female voice, which is not always women mystics. It's sometimes men who choose to channel the female voice, which also alters the timber of the poetry. But we'll come to that in a minute. Um, I wanted to talk about them because for many people, the only women mystics from India that they know of are Mirabai and Andal mm -hmm. and maybe Akka Mahadevi, mm -hmm. but that's about it. And very often these portraits have been sanitized to such an extent, you know, they've turned into calendar art images. So uh, these are really, they often are women who are presented to us as followers, meek followers not as women who wear their bodies like, say, Annapurnia Madas. You know, it's a fully reclaimed, completely inhabited body. You know, unapologetic for their, about their physicality as well. Yeah. So I wanted just room for other voices and more dangerous. Uh, I wanted to reclaim the danger in those voices. Do you consider yourself to be a mystic? No, but I consider myself to be a spiritual traveler. What does that mean? How come you didn't ask me that about these four women? Because that's how I <laughs> describe them. <laughs> because you've been so articulate in describing them that I get it. But I'm curious now about your journey also. I think for many years I believed that most of my answers, and I had many questions just like every person does, questions about living and dying and what's it all about, all the old existential questions. And I believe that most of my answers to those questions would come from poetry and would come from literature and would come from the performing art traditions that I love, dance and theater. And up to a point in my life, they did. And then one day, I found myself in a place of such a visceral, wordlessness. I was really deserted by language, basically. And when I found myself in that place, none of the arts, none of my poems came to my rescue. And so I think that's when I realized that I had to come to terms with this silence, which of course lies at the center of all the arts in their own, in its, you know, in each in a, in a very singular way. There was a conversation earlier that I think David Nassau had with uh, Andre Asimov where he talked of stillness. I mean, he talked of silence in music. I'm certainly aware of the stillness on the stage that a dancer brings your attention to. I'm certainly aware as a poet of the pause that is so vital on a page of poetry. But I had to make my peace with those pauses because I think I was derailed by a pause. So uh, that's when I think 
a journey that I would describe as spiritual unfolded in my life. What, is, what do people mean when they refer to the divine feminine? I feel like that is a, the sacred feminine or the divine feminine. These are phrases that slip into general vocabulary and there is a specific image that comes into mind. Uh, sometimes it is a, it is a Kali-like image. Uh, sometimes it is a more mystical image. And I, I, I would really love to have the wisdom and articulation that you bring to the subject on this question. So I will talk for myself. I was always, you know, on some level drawn to the notion of the goddess because it appealed to some feminist sensibility, right? That you want a, uh, the notion of the sacred in some way to acknowledge the embodiment of femininity. So you wanted an image, at least, that could speak to you. So on some level, ideologically, it made sense to me. But if I were to move from that to a very personal experience, I will say that in the year 2010, when I walked into a very newly consecrated goddess temple in southern India, and I sat there, I... Uh, I felt I had been introduced to, some, to a presence that I had always known. And the 33 names of the goddess were being uttered in that temple. And there was a great surge of something that I will not call ideological and not even just emotional. It was a sense of remembrance, a, sur a kind of energetic surge of being where I needed to be. So I don't want to over explain the goddess. I think on some intuitive level, most people get it. It's an archetype, really, that we all resonate with on some level. And I don't even think one needs to over-explain it because we get it. But I think, for me, the goddess became the presence that I perhaps uh, related to immediately because I saw this as a deeply engaged presence. Um, and em I saw this as not just an invitation to transcendence, but an invitation to inhabit myself. With all that goes with being human, flawed, um, broken, physical, perishable, the goddess engages. I think that's the difference. And I think somewhere that is an image that speaks to us, perhaps with, because of the idea of the mother goddess as well. Yeah. That is not a distant figure. It's a deeply engaged figure. Yeah. I mean, and it's no coincidence, I think, that nearly all the countries in the world are women because that is the engagement as well that one has with countries. Mm -hmm. um, this thing that you spoke of, this, the attraction of feminism uh, when you're thinking about the goddess, goddess imagery, it reminds me of Lata Mani, the one of your protagonists, and you know this, she was my favorite. Uh, that was the essay that I felt the most connection with. And I think it's an extraordinary thing that you marry the feminism, Marxism, intellectual um, journey of this character, uh, of this person, with her more spiritual journey. You, have, you bring in the creative fire and the imagination. She's also a very creative person. But you somehow as she enters a, the more traumatic stage of her life, she ends up on a spiritual journey, but doesn't distance herself from her intellectual life in any way. How does one marry those things so beautifully? I don't think the marriage happens in the mind, this I will say. And I'm not taking an anti-intellectual stance because I know that that's also part of your question. The implicit question really is, does the spiritual journey imply an anti-intellectual position? And I'd say to that very fundamentally, no, no. None of the women in this book are um, in any way antagonistic either to body or to mind. Lata, in this case, is the scholar that I mentioned earlier, the woman who was um, a, on her way to work, collided with this Pepsi truck, and had this experience where her life turned turtle in every way. A woman who had occupied her mind suddenly found herself in her body, which was a site of agonizing pain, 
not just for days and months, but for years. That was the nature of the brain injury. And she found that somewhere in that unspeakable anguish, things began to shift. And there was, for her, a certain stillness, a certain presence that began to deepen. And as she started coming out of that, she, she talks of her guides, non-physical guides. One of them is the goddess. But as she starts coming out of that, her question is not about repudiating the past in order to validate her present. That's not her journey. Her journey is really about, yes, this was the richness of my past, these were the stances I took and they still matter to me, but something else has opened up that has deepened my life. So it is really an invitation to deepening, not to amputating the mind. And I think that's really important often to remember because uh, very many people have the other question, which is, is the spiritual journey about severing the body? Is it about in some way uh, denying the body in order to move into the spirit? Which is why I speak of Makar Puri, the monk, who is really far from leading a life of self-denial. There is nothing about her life that's cheerless. It's a life of great abundance, of great plenitude. She remembers all the hundred saris she wore in her earlier life. But she is happy to have worn them and is happy to be wearing something else now. So none of these women is really asking us to chop off inconvenient parts of ourselves. They are, I think, reminding us that there's more to us than body and more to us than mind. What that more is, is to be explored. So would you say then that a, a person is three in three parts, the body, the mind, and the spirit? Yes, and except that these are all wonderfully overlapping categories because there is the visceral nature of the mind and there is the intelligence of the body. So there's all of that. This is really about a deepening, just, just getting to know yourself better, living in yourself a little more. Yeah. You know, not being in a hurry to... This is something that my training as a poet teaches me, Mansi. Not to be in a hurry to reach for a conclusion. Because the world around us constantly wants us to reach for conclusions. Even to present ourselves to the world, you know, are you this or are you this? And you have to hurriedly choose the epithet that you think sums you up. But really... This is a journey, and poetry for me has always been about that. It's been a place where you allow yourself to flounder a bit, to, to grope, and then look for the word, and then receive that word with gratitude, or the image with gratitude, and allow it to lead you where it will. You know, So it's not about a pre-formulated identity, it's about deepening and uncovering your deeper identities. So the sentiment that we both sort of alluded to, which is that the spiritual life is somehow antithetical to the intellectual life. I think I, I, think I probably come with that kind of bias in me. I identify as atheist, Arundhati knows this. And for me, I, have, like, I find in myself a great resistance to the mystical, the spiritual, the religious. I wonder if you think if you have seen a cause for this bias, if that is the right word, where does it come from? Because when I read about Lata, it, it makes sense to me. But it's still hard for me to overcome my resistance. So I'm really curious, where, where does this resistance even come from? I think it comes from centuries of, uh, you know, completely justifiable mistrust that we have because of the ways in which uh, faiths have been, um, you know, the ways in which the idea of faith has been mangled and misused and um, abused and institutionalized and encrusted and, and we see all the terrible manifestations of that. But you use religious, mystical, spiritual all in one breath, which I must say gave me pause because being atheist is in no way incompatible with any of the journeys in this book, I would argue. And I'll say why. 
when we come to the point or when we come to this whole question of the mystical, we are not talking about a belief system at all. When you're an atheist, you've already got a belief in place. I don't believe in this. That's a belief. When we're talking about this particular dimension, we are talking about the experiential, where people are actually just gobsmacked and surprised they were walking along one way and something else came and ambushed them from the other. That's how it happened for Lata. For someone else, it happens as a deepening clarity. For someone else, it happens as an unexpected pause in their lives, as it did for me. So it's really not, at the end of it, about having another conclusion and saying, now I've turned from being atheist to believer, because I haven't. I wasn't an atheist, and I'm not a believer. But I am on a journey. I am on a journey on which I'm not seeking, I'm not trying to uh, replace one set of beliefs with another, but I am seeking a more spirited and more authentic response to this very uncertain world I live in. Are there any godless mystics? I'd say many, and even for these very people, since we're talking about these four women, and I don't want to go away, the Buddha, for one, you could argue, is one. Mm. But that, he doesn't ask you to believe in any uh, deity. But even these women, when they speak of a particular deity, it's much more as an archetypal figure. And that's the wonderful thing for me about the Indian spiritual culture at its finest. We are not always at our finest. But when we are, when we are, we are at our best, we are pretty good. And one of the things we do well is to allow ourselves this tremendous license to have 330 million, supposedly, gods and goddesses. And you can choose a deity who's most suited to your taste and your temperament. It could be a tree, it could be a river, it could be a, a wonderful figure with, you know, the face of an animal that is beloved to you. You could choose your god. And this God becomes your ally and your companion and the other that you talk to. It's a very uh, deep intelligence that underlies that, this, this other that you have this intimate relationship with. So you can choose your God, you can invent your God. You have this a la carte menu to choose from. And if you don't find one, you make one. And if you don't want to make one, you toss the whole lot out of the window. And you still continue on your journey to freedom. They're not essential. So in the Bhakti book, for instance, Eating God, it's really about um, devotees who talk of a passionate relationship with the other, but eventually, as Tukaram says, for me, God is dead. What does he mean by that? This is a relationship that is so explosive that it allows you to annihilate the other, but you might get annihilated too. So then, just as we spoke about the marriage between the spiritual and the intellectual, is it maybe time to divorce the religious and the spiritual? I do, and I think in the book I talk about that, right? I talk about it in the introduction as well. The fact that uh, my interest, as far as this journey is concerned, is not with the sentries and the spokespersons of a faith. I'm interested in the sadhaka, the seeker, mm -hmm. the traveler, someone who is looking for first-hand experience and not second-hand knowledge. And that's what these women represent to me, that molten place which I think lies at the center or perhaps once lay at the center of almost every wisdom tradition in the world. That place that we so easily allow to get encrusted by all the appurtenances of belief and ritual and all the rest of it. And where is your own journey taking you? Where has it brought you thus far and where do you think it will take you? I think it's taken, taken me to a place where I'm uh, a little more comfortable with the pause than I was and um, I don't know where it will take me but I do hope that it allows me to le live my life less fearfully less rigidly, less dogmatically, because there are all kinds of dogmatism, aren't there? I mean, it's not just the dogmatism of religion, there's also the dogmat dogmatism of, uh, of the rationalist. And I always believed as a poet that I wasn't part of either dogmatism, but you know, we turn to rigidity every time we are scared. So I'm sure we all do that. We all freeze reality when we can, because the alternative is too 
scary. Yeah. So I hope it is about learning to live uh, an uncertain life with a little more grace. And do you see a path towards renunciation like some of your protagonists have taken? One has taken a path of renunciation, that is Makar Puri, mm. the monk. The other, in fact, as I said, moves from uh, ochre to wearing you know, everyday clothes. So that's her journey. I don't know where my journey will take me. What I do know is that um, I've already had more twists and turns in my life than I ever quite anticipated. So I don't know where it's going to take me next. And let's kind of bring this round to full circle and talk about the role of poetry in all of this. You are, I, would you say, first and foremost a poet? I would have said that at one point, and uh, depending on the context I'm in, I would still say that. Mm. Perhaps for this conversation, I'd say I'm a seeker and poet. So, poet, there has been the bhakti tradition, which is, which is all about uh, the, where the seeker meets poetry, I think. Tell me about how these two lives of yours intersect uh, as a poet, as a person on this very specific journey that you're on. And being a poet, this is the thing, right? People, being a poet is also about, about recording the time that you exist in. Your poetry is going to be read 100,000 years from now. The only great record we will ever have of this time is poetry, and you're contributing to that brilliant archive with your poetry. Tell me how these two worlds coexist for you as well. That's an optimistic view of poetry, but I'm glad you have it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I share that, but yes, I do believe that poetry speaks to us in, in much deeper places than many of the other more discursive prose forms uh, do. That's another matter. I don't know if it will last forever, in, you know, for as long as you say, but as far as the connections between the life of the seeker and the life of the poet are concerned, I think... I think I said this earlier, didn't I, Mansi? I think the really both to me are so integrally related because they're both about learning to become comfortable with commas and question marks rather than with the period, the full stop. Yeah. Neither of them is about the full stop. They're really about dash hyphens and finding yourself in those precarious hyphens, not quite this, not quite that. How do you make sense of both? That's really the domain of poetry for me. And uh, that for me is really what uh, the spiritual life uh, has led me to, to acknowledge that I am not just fl flesh and I'm not just some puff of vapor, I'm both. That's the kind of terrific possibility of being human. I'm both this and more. And I'm not just that. I'm not just transcendent, and I'm not just here and now. I'm both. I'm the axis. You and that's how important multitudes. we all are. I'm sorry? You contain multitudes. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Thanks, indeed. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what else you're working on, and maybe a little bit about the craft of writing as well. Well, I had a book of poems out last year, a year before last, which I will be reading from tomorrow. So poetry is always ongoing in my life, but I do hope to go back to that anthology that I mentioned, yeah. you know, uh, Women's Voices, which started with a festival that I curated in India, in Bombay some years ago. Uh, it was called Wild Women, and that may well be the title of the anthology. I love that title. I hope you'll enjoy the book. I really look If it ever happens. I really look forward to it. And uh, a little bit about the craft as well, because I think, I think the writing of poetry has its own craft. And this morning I was talking to two fiction writers and their craft is quite specific about how they come into the process. But, you know, poetry is the kind of thing where I read poetry by dipping into it. So I'm curious, do you write poetry at a stretch or by dipping into it as well? No, I don't write poetry at a stretch. What I do is... For me, when I write prose like this book, but this book is not just prose, it's prose interspersed with poems. When I write prose, I see it as kind of manual labor. I get up every day and hammer away for a little while at my laptop. But when it's poetry, I write fragments 
and I allow those fragments to accumulate over a period of time. And a very important part of my process is veiling, which means I try to forget what I've written. I don't look at it for long spells of time. I veil it from myself, mm -hmm. really. And then when I go back to it, and I allow myself to open that page on a computer or you know, a file at my desk, I open that, and then if that fragment speaks to me, I know it has a reason to exist. It has its right to exist. Frequently, that's the point at which I discover that one fragment that, you, that I wrote, at one maybe today, actually segues into something that I wrote a year ago. And here I was believing I was original and writing different things all the time, but in fact I was saying the same thing. And then the two come together, and often the result is a poem. So do you reread yourself? Do I reread myself? I yeah. do, yes. You mean after it's printed? Well, yes, and also like it sounds to me like it is such a long process then, because you have gone back to something that you wrote quite a while ago. There's been at least four or five years between each of my books of poetry. Wow, that, I mean, that's, that is extraordinary. No, it's a fair amount of rigor, this I will say, that goes into the making of a no, poem. No, I, I, I mean, I, that, that's kind of also what I mean, that it is an extraordinary journey that takes you to each work of poetry. Mm -hmm. But this book you mentioned, you wrote in a year. This particular book, yes. I think the pandemic might have had something to do with it. Mm. I was just so isolated and yeah. so quiet. I worked in a kind of ferocious manner on this book. Yeah. And uh, I wrote the first two essays and I knew it needed two more essays and then I drew on material with people I happened to know, worked on it intensely. I was also concerned that the interviews would date, which I didn't want. Yeah, I, I, which also, I mean, I, what I also find interesting is that you have not restricted yourself in terms of like geographies and timelines uh, as well. Have the women read the book? I hope so. I think uh, two of them have. The other two have received the book, but they lead, as I said, uh, fairly mm. hermetic lives, some of them. So uh, the, the two of them who have read the book have chosen to share it with others, so I hope that means something good. Have they to spoken to you about it? They have. They have. Yeah. I think um, it meant different things to each of them. For one of them, it felt like she said it was really like watching snapshots of her life, that is Makar Puri. Mm. And I was, I was happy to know that because um, I was in a sense, in her case, it wasn't just a conversation. I was attempting to encapsulate her life in the course of that essay, which is something I didn't do for the other four women, other three women. And Lata, who's the, the other person who has read the book and responded, I think she felt... Um, I think she found it interesting to find this other perspective, this other gaze, because she is also a writer in her own right. And she found it interesting to see this other gaze that was um, friendly, respectful, and terribly curious looking into her life. So I think we now have about 15 minutes for audience questions. Uh, we might have a mic doing the round, so please raise your hand and it will come to you. So I don't think my question is the seeker, traveler process of mysticism. Is that taking you deeper into the subconscious mind or are you, you think it's taking you to a new dimension altogether. I think, you know, this, at some point, whatever one does, whether it is meditation or even just the creative process of any kind, and when I say creative process, I don't necessarily mean writing poems. It could be, you know, cooking a meal every day at home or maybe even writing graffiti on the walls of a urinal. Whatever it is, whatever your creative process, I think it does open up the subconscious in some way. There's no escaping that. So that becomes part of one's um, journey of uh, knowing the self. But um, is that all it is? I think not. 
I think not. And uh, I don't want to get too abstruse about this or sound, uh, you know, like one is being... I don't want this to sound in any sense self-aggrandizing because it's really about the most... Uh, it's just really about doing all the everyday things we do with greater and greater levels of attention and really that's what it is, this journey, isn't it? And... Um, the attentiveness and the, the expansiveness and the depth that accompanies that process is what makes it worthwhile, I suppose. You know, there is a, more, there's a greater aliveness about one's life. There's just more aliveness and um, more clarity. And the, those are the rewards along the way. Yeah. I guess uh, you said something that you're a seeker as well as a poet. In terms of seeker, I haven't read much of your work, but do you envision that as, as part of your journey and as you write, uh, are you learning that you are a bubble or that you are an ocean? I think Kabir talks of all those things so much better than I do. So I'm not going there. But you know he has that beautiful poem about, uh, about it not just being about uh, a drop melting into the ocean, but an ocean melting into the drop, exactly. which is a beautiful image. Yeah, so I won't even attempt to go there. Let me just say that uh, I'll go back to what I said in response to his question, that um, There were lots of gnawing questions in my life at one point, and it's not like I have a whole bunch of answers. It's just that there is, and this has been said before, it's not an original answer. It's just that there's a little more space around those questions now for me, and they uh, are less corrosive, and they eat my innards a little less than they used to. Um, it's a um, couple of questions, but I think this was one of the most beautiful discussions of mysticism uh, that I've heard in a long time, so congratulations. Um, two questions. One is, is there in your understanding, perception, a difference between a feminine mysticism or feminine approach to mysticism and a masculine approach to mysticism. And I say that, with, we take away the stereotypes. Yeah. Um, so if you're really in meditation or in silence, are you really a woman? Mm -hmm. That's one question. And the second question is, um, in India, of course, there has been a long tradition of female mystics, but it has not been talked about, starting from Lalla in Kashmir and to recently uh, in Pondicherry, a whole movement which is interesting because they talk of integral yoga, which means not just the mind, heart, emotions, but the body transformation where the tantra meets Vedanta. So I would like to hear your thoughts about that. Actually, Parikshit, I'm looking forward to our conversation tomorrow. We are going to be in conversation tomorrow around a book that he's written on Sri Aurobindo, a very major uh, mystic and sage of the 20th century. So I don't want to um, uh, overlap too much with what we're going to be talking about, but I will say this, and I say this in my introduction to the book, so I'm glad you asked the question. You know, when I was in college, I remember reading this essay by a feminist theologian who said something that had a deep impact on me. Uh, she says that for many male uh, seekers on spiritual journeys of various kinds, the obstacle is often regarded to be ego, resistance. Whereas for women, very often the obstacle could be quite the reverse, the absence of ego or the tendency to outsource one's identity to a whole lot of other places, other external sources, really looking externally for validation, or the fact, the fact that we're just encouraged very often to become people pleasers. 
um, appeasers, mollifiers. So the journey, she says, and this made sense to me, often has to be inflected differently. The terminology is often really about vocabulary. You know, the word surrender, for instance, has become, is such a loaded word. So I'm very conscious when I use, uh, in certain conversations, not to use the word at all, because it is, in fact, it, atrocities have been committed in, that, in the name of that word. So how do we speak of the spiritual journey to mean not passive surrender, but dynamic receptivity, which I think is what the female presence, you know, needs to be reminded of. This is not um, the absence of spine. It's a reclamation of spine, you know? So it's just touching on a possible answer to your question, but we'll talk about this. So I want to dovetail. I actually love that question as well. And so I have in my mind what I think mystic means. And so it's interesting as you separate these two words, seeker and mystic. And so I'm just in, in the simplest form, how, do you, how would you define mystic? And as you talk, wrote about these four women, like what are those common characteristics as they are named this word mystic. So, um, I use the word mystic again there, but I really, in the title of the book, I call them spiritual travelers. That's really what I call them. But I, and I talk a little about how we could understand mysticism, although it has been so diversely defined. So I'm not here to give you a, a, a dictionary definition as much as I would say, that there is a great thirst for a first-hand experience, an experiential understanding that is not just about the mind, that is a deeply lived experience of a truth, of truth, the truth of who I am, the truth of this moment, which is not just the conversation we're having, but also what's happening in my left toe as we're having this conversation, a full reality, a deep uh, understanding of what it means to be me at this moment in time. So for me, that really is what interested me about these four women, that they're looking for something experiential and firsthand. They're not settling for scriptural knowledge. They don't spout scripture, none of them. They use some symbols, cultural symbols that are typical of their particular uh, sectarian affiliations, but they are not sectarian in any narrow parochial way. These are for them images that, are, uh, that open up worlds for them. So that would be my answer to your question about the mystic. About the seeker, I'd say I call myself a spiritual traveler because I see this as an endlessly unfolding journey. And that journey is very much underway. So, uh, you know, it's really not something one sets out to do. It's just a tug in a particular direction, and you follow that tug, and you see where it leads you. As uh, someone whose poetry is intense and also stunningly crafted, would you say a poem exists within its words, independently of its words, would you say a poem just wears its words? That's a question that deserves a pause. So I'm giving it the pause that it deserves. Yes, I think there's a... It reminds me of that wonderful image, uh, Gopal, of the, the image maker, the, the idol maker who says that he doesn't, when he sees the rock, he, um, he sees the idol, he sees the image already. All he needs to do is to remove some of the extraneous stuff. Uh, the idol is already there, so he's only allowing it to emerge, but it was always there. At the best of times, a poem can be that at the best of times. I wish those times would happen more often in my life, 
when they do, it's the magic, really, that at the moment when all that manual labor that I spoke of earlier, when that manual labor and then the magic come together, you know you're absolutely in the right place and the right time, and that alignment itself is, is joy. I have a question. I never ask questions, but I'll try. <laughs> a little nervous, but early on in your talk, you talked about how um, the women mystics, the, most of them, uh, the, of the Thor, um, didn't block out um, in the same way that, you know, we know a lot of male mystics and, and seekers, you know, they take sannyas and then they leave their family or they go up and they, they, they leave everything. Um, whereas some females have done that, but many, many of us seekers, we still stay within sort of the system, but still find our own voice within that. Why would you, um, what would you say inspires that difference or, you know? That's a wonderful question. Temperament, I think, really. Orientation, personal orientation. Sometimes it's, you know, there were times perhaps when it was just easier to opt for the monastic life because it simplified your life. You allow, it allowed you to devote your time to the things you wanted to concern yourself with, not uh, all the other things that, you know, an everyday, the drudgery of an outside life seemed to entail. So when you read the nuns of the Terigatha, uh, you know, the Buddhist text, they're really hymns of freedom from drudgery. You know, that's part of it too, but not all of it. So the reason in this book, I wanted both kinds of figures. I wanted a monk, but I also wanted someone who gave up the monastic life as the second figure does. And this is not, there's no advocacy in this, you know. I think each woman is on her path and I'm just grateful to have been able to look in for a little while and share some of that journey. I really wouldn't, say, and none of them is really saying one is superior to the other. This for me was wonderful. And even the monk, even that woman uh, whom I mention in the book, there is really nothing dismal and cheerless about her life. You know, she, in fact, in many ways, she is perhaps the woman who leads the most abundant life. You know, she's a giver. The sense I, uh, you know, I have when I'm around her is always around about being in the presence of someone who is, uh, who lives in plenitude. So, uh, I think part of the, the attempt of this book was also to blur what has become really very fragmented parts, almost as if these are mutually exclusive. They're not. I don't think they need to be. You know, they blur a lot and there are many convergences between the parts. So thank you for sharing these journeys with us and for your, sharing your journey with us. That really meant a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Mansi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.